Good afternoon, one second, Excellency Stashus, uh, our distinguished speaker, Professor John S. T. Kua, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the third lecture of the ninth uh, Rick's anniversary lecture series. Now. Under the benevolent and far-sighted leadership of His Majesty the King, Rick's was established nine years ago in October 2013 as a leadership development institute and a think tank. Inspired by His Majesty's vision, leadership, and service to our country and people, the Institute has designed and offered several different programs over the past nine years with the primary objective of promoting excellence in governance and leadership. And we continue to do so with renewed vigor and zeal as our country undertakes major transformative initiatives focused on progress, prosperity, and people towards achieving our new vision of becoming a developed nation within the shortest time frame possible. As we commemorate our ninth anniversary, we are happy to bring to you the ninth Rick's anniversary lecture series, which started on the 9th of October. That was two days ago. The series of lectures this week are inspired by a book Ambassador Tommy Ko of Singapore edited called The 50 Secrets of Singapore Success. Therefore, the overall theme of the lecture series is nation building lessons from Singapore's success. And the four lectures under the series by different speakers will dwell on different aspects of Singapore's success as a nation that we can draw from. We are deeply grateful to Ambassador Tommy Ko for not only agreeing to be a speaker in this series, but also for recommending and introducing us to the distinguished speakers we had for our anniversary lecture series. By the way, Ambassador Course Friday Forum lecture is coming up on the 14th of October. That is the after tomorrow. And we invite all of you to register for the same through the RICS website or our Facebook page. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for today, we are happy and honored to have Professor John Kua to talk on learning from Singapore's success in combating corruption. And I have no doubt all of us will gain useful ideas and insights on how best we can deal with corruption back home. After all, a clean government, a clean public service, and a clean citizenry are the foundations on which strong and successful countries like Singapore stand and continue to grow up on. We are also honored and thankful to have the Honorable Chairperson of the Anti-Corruption Commission, Amdiki Pema, to moderate the session today. So without further ado, let me hand over to our moderator to introduce our speaker and begin the session. Uh, Chair, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, uh, Professor John Kwa, uh, distinguished guests uh, joining in from Bhutan and elsewhere. Um, very good afternoon. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here today and to uh, be invited to moderate this session. Um, I would like to thank Riggs and also uh, felicitate Riggs on its ninth uh, anniversary. Um, let me um, start with uh, the introduction of our very distinguished uh, speaker today. Um, Professor John Kwa is a Singapore citizen by uh, birth. He was a professor of political science at the National University of Singapore until his retirement in June 2007, after 35 years of service. While at NUS, Professor Kwa also held significant positions such as Vice Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Coordinator of the European Studies Program, and the head of Department of Political Science, to name a few. He is now an anti-corruption consultant based in Singapore and an honorary advisor of the Hong Kong Public Administration Association. He was a member of Interpol's Standing Committee on Ethical Matters from September 2015 to September 2021 and vice president of the Asian Association for Public Administration from 2010 to 2012. Professor 
So I received his Bachelor of Social Science Honours Degree in, Jan in June 1969 and Masters of Social Science and Political Science in March 1971 from the University of Singapore and PhD in Political Science majoring in, um, majoring in Public Administration from the Florida State University in 1975 on a Fulbright Hayes Scholarship. His visiting appointments included scholarly work at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Harvard University, University of California at Berkeley, Stanford, Australian National University, and the Shisen University in Taiwan. He began doing research on corruption and governance in Asian countries in 1977, and has served as a consultant to Transparency International, the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and the World Bank. He was the lead consultant for the UNDP program in accountability and transparency in New York to assist the Mongolian government in preparing a national anti-corruption plan from September to November 1998. He was also a consultant to the Macau SAR government to review the personal management of the Macau civil service from September 2000 to May 2001. He was appointed by the agency Against Corruption Ministry of Justice in Taipei, Taiwan, as a member of the International Review Committee to review the Republic of China's initial report under the United Nations Convention Against Corruption from April to August 2018. To date, Professor has done research on corruption in 20 Asian countries and published extensively on this topic with several of his books and papers winning notable accolades. He received the Outstanding Author Contribution Award at the Emerald Literati Network Awards for Excellence in 2011 for his book, Public Administration Singapore Style, and in 2012 for his book, Curbing Corruption in Asian Countries and Impossible Dream. His 2014 article, Curbing Police Corruption in Singapore, Lessons for Other Asian Countries received the Outstanding Paper Award in 2015. In 2018, his article, Why Singapore Works, Five Secrets of Singapore's Success, won the Outstanding Paper Award in 2019 and has since then been downloaded 111, 111 393 times. His 2020 article, Corruption Scandals in Six Asian Countries, a Comparative Analysis, received the Outstanding Paper Award at the Emerald Latrati Network Awards for Excellence in 2021. Professor, we are really honored and uh, privileged to have you uh, here with us today and to speak to us about anti-corruption and about Singapore's experience and lessons that we can learn here in Bhutan in terms of combating corruption. Um, Professor CV, the, what I read out was only a brief uh, from his very, very impressive and uh, very uh, bulky, should I say, uh, uh, CV. And it's a real honor to have you here with us, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson Pema. Thank you, Pema. Uh, so I'd like to, to thank the director, Chairman Rinzin, for inviting me to give this lecture. It's my honor to share my views on fighting corruption. Also, the congratulations Ricks on the ninth anniversary, ninth anniversary. Now, may I uh, go on to Mrs. Shedders? Sorry. Um, I would like to uh, remind all the um, attendees, participants, that uh, please uh, keep your uh, keep notes and all the questions that you would like to pose to Professor. We will have some time at the end uh, to ask some questions and answers. Uh, we also have the Slido. You have to go to slido.com and there's a password okay. that you can use. Uh, 
First, uh, before I start, I want to say that as as the chairperson mentioned, I began doing research in 1977 when it was not fashionable to do research on corruption. In fact, we couldn't use the word corruption in our research proposal. We had to use the term negative bureaucratic behavior. But a lot has changed now. Now, corruption is a very hot topic. There are stories of corruption every day all around the world. So I think I want to, to begin today, I want to highlight I want to focus on these five aspects today. First, looking at how Bhutan and Singapore has performed in terms of fighting corruption using two indicators. Then I try to explain why Singapore has succeeded in fighting corruption. Third, because Bhutan and Singapore, even though they're small countries, they are quite different. So to consider what Bhutan can learn from Singapore, we have to, to discuss the contextual differences. Then I'll try to highlight some lessons which Bhutan can learn, which experienced and conclude the lecture. Now, if you look at, before I start, before I, I think I want to share what our late Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew said after serving, after being Prime Minister for 20 years. In 1979, at the 25th anniversary of the People's Asian Party, he identified six lessons after serving as Prime Minister. One of the lessons was to stay clean, dismiss the villa. This is very important, and I think this is one major reason why Singapore has succeeded. We do not tolerate corruption. There's zero tolerance for corruption in Singapore. Anyone who is not guilty of corruption, no matter his status, his position, population, is punished. We don't pardon people for corruption. South Korea pardons people. We don't. South Korea pardons. Now, table one shows how the Bhutan and Singapore has performed on corruption percent index and the World Bank's control of corruption. But these two indicators are not perfect. In fact, there's no perfect indicator because they are based on perception, but they're the most useful and most commonly cited indicators. So for CPI, you can see Bhutan from 2012. I use 2012 forward because they changed the scoring to, to 0 to 100. So 2012 Bhutan, 63 from 100 has gone up to 68 latest available figures for 2021. So there's improvement. Average 66 for this year. Singapore, 87, top 25. But overall average is 85. And then World Bank control corruption, also the same thing. You see the percentile ranks here from 79.15% Bhutan to 938 percentile rank to Zantano. Singapore has been all along in the 90s, you can see. 1998.56. So basically, both have done well. Now, if you look at case of Bhutan, Bhutan is the top performer, the top performer in the South Asian region. It is an outlier. You can see among the, the nine countries, Bhutan is the best, ranked 25th, 68 CPI. And the gap between Bhutan and India and Maldives is quite large, 28 points. And of course, the bottom is Afghanistan. Now, how do we explain Singapore's success in fighting corruption? I think the colonial government, British colonial government, was frankly not interested in fighting corruption. There, there was a very weak political will. And this was shown in the silly mistakes they made. Two mistakes they made. First, the po police corruption was very serious, was widespread. Two commissions of inquiry, 1879, 1886. These two commissions found that police corruption was widespread. Even then, the British made the anti-corruption branch police force responsible for fighting corruption in 1937. So this is a big mistake. And this mistake became obvious in 1951 when 
three police detectives were caught stealing 1,800 pounds of opium worth about US $33,000. Because of this incident, the government replaced the anti-corruption branch with the Corrupt Practice Investment Bureau in September 1952. That's why the CPIB is the oldest anti-corruption agency in the world. It was started in September 1952. Second mistake was having set up a CPIB, the government did not provide it with enough resources to fight corruption. When it was set up, there were only 13 staff, increased to 22 end of the year, but still not enough. But worse still, most of the staff were seconded police officers, which means that they had a big problem finding corruption. When police corruption was rampant, how do you ask police officers to investigate their own colleagues? This was a problem they faced. There's a huge conflict of interest. So because of these two problems, the other problems, they find it difficult to collect evidence in the investigation. So because of this, the CPIB was, I call, a paper tiger, a toothless tiger, was ineffective in finding corruption. So when the PP government, People's Protection Party government, came to power in June 1959, after winning May 59 general election, they were different from the colonial government. They wanted to fight corruption. Li Kuan Yew had a strong political will to find corruption. So they did two things. First, passed the End Prevention of Corruption Act in June 1960. This act is very powerful, very important, very powerful. Give the CPIB enormous powers. And secondly, they gave the CPIB enough money and personnel budget to enable it to perform its functions effectively. Let me show you table, tables three and four. Table three, I've given the figures from 2012 onwards. 2012 budget, US 20.29 million, 133 personnel. This increased to 35.4 million US million dollars, 2020, and 234%. Table four shows the per capita expenditure of CPIP and staff profit value. This is how I measure political will. When the government says it's strong political will, does it give the ACA enough money personnel to do its job? You can see here CPIB per capital expenditure, 212 US three, $3.82, increased to 2020 US $6.23. Stop population ratio improved from 1,000, 1 to, 1, 1 to 38,483 in 2012 to 1 is to 24,298 in 2020. Now, I calculate this by looking at the population country for this same year. Now, the CPIB is, effect, is an effective independent watchdog that enforces the PCA, the law, impartially. It is a type A anti corruption agency. I see two types of ACAs. One is type A, that means the ACA only performs anti corruption functions. It is not distracted by other functions. Type B ACA is less effective because there are many other functions. You've got fighting corruption plus many other things. Very often, it's the other functions that become more important. For example, tai Taiwan. Taiwan is uh, the Ministry of Justice and Information Bureau, Investigative Bureau, MGIB. It's a lead agency, but it is actually a security agency. And fighting corruption is only part of it. But it gets all the, all the budget as I mentioned. So the thing is that, if you have a choice, set up type A, not type B. Bhutan has made the right choice. Bhutan ACC is type A. So a type A agency that performs these three functions according to the CPIP, receiving investigating complaints on public private sectors, investigating malpractices is conducted by civil servants, and three, preventing corruption by examining practices, procedures, and public service to minimize opportunities for corruption. So, now, also the CPIB 
enforces the sorry this yes second the cpib adopts a total approach to enforcement and what, what does it mean? First, it focuses on both big and small cases of public and private sector corruption, regardless of the amount, rank, status of persons being in this game. In fact, some years ago, even a $1 bribe was investigated by the CPI. Second, the same processes and procedures apply to those being investigated, including ministers and CEOs of companies. No difference. Everyone gets treated the same way. Bribe givers and bribe takers, as they are equally coverable by the PC. Singapore citizens working in Singapore embassies and in abroad can also be prosecuted for corruption offenses committed in other countries. That means as though they committed offenses in Singapore. So there's no escape. Finally, other offenses uncovered, basic corruption offenses, will be referred to police and other agencies for action. Now, so this. Third, the CPIB enforces the PCA impartially, regardless of the status, position, or political affiliation of those persons being investigated. First, the Prime Minister and Ministers have not interfered in daily operations. The Prime Minister is in charge of CPIB, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, interfere. And in fact, the Cabinet Secretary is the one that the director CP CPIB reports to. The CPIB has vacated five PAP leaders from 1966 to 2016, and eight senior civil servants from 1991 to 2020. That means nobody is exempt from investigation. Also, no opposition leader or party member has so far been investigated with CPIB, as it's not a title. Because no complaints have been made. If complaints are made, of course, there will be investigation. The CPIB director can obtain the elected president's consent to investigate allegations of corruption against ministers, members of parliament, and senior civil servants if the prime minister revokes his consent. In other words, even a prime minister can be investigated by the CPIB if there's a complaint. Now, let's go on to talk about the contextual differences between Bhutan and Singapore. In terms of land area, both Bhutan and Singapore are very small, but Bhutan is 53 times larger than Singapore, which is which shows you how small Singapore is. In fact, my lectures on at the NUS before, when I talk about Singapore, the area of Singapore is the same as Lake Taupo in North Island, New Zealand, and slightly larger than Lake Biwa in Kyoto, near Kyoto, Japan. Bhutan population. Legacy, so it was called a British, but Bhutan has never been colonized. GDP per capita, Singapore's GDP per capita much higher than uh, Bhutan by about 24 times. And political system, Bhutan has considered monarchy, Singapore is parliamentary democracy. In terms of the total governance percentile rank, this is how we look at the, the uh, measure of governance in the country. Using six indicators of World Bank, the total is 600. So Bhutan scores 417.4, Singapore 535.4 percent of rank. Now, the first, so in terms of lessons Bhutan, I think the Bhutan score, CPI score, has improved from 63 in 2012 to 16. 2021. This is the fourth least corrupt Asian country in 2001 after Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan. Actually, Japan's score is too high because Japan is still a lot of structural crime. So, in, in, the world, in other words, actually, Bhutan is third, actually. You don't, don't count Japan. Anyway, how can Bhutan improve its CPI score from an average of 66 
to above 70. Bhutan has done about 66, but can it do better? I think it can. I think how it can improve is that the ACC Anti-Corruption Commission must increase its factors by attracting retaining personnel to minimize its vacancies and reduce its work back to backlog in investigating corruption cases. Also, the Royal Government of Bhutan must continue to provide ACC with adequate budget personnel and initiate reforms to address causes of corruption. In fact, after the Swiss emergency withdrew its financial aid, it's more very important that the Royal Government continues to provide the ACC with adequate funds, resources to fight corruption. Now, the two problems faced by ACC are high turnover and number of vacancies. If you look at this comparison I did, 2016, of five ACAs in Asia, Hong Kong ICAC, Bangladesh ACC, Bhutan ACC, Philippines uh, Office of Ombudsman, Sri Lanka's Commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption, you find that the Bhutan's has 62 vacancies of 42% to 2016. It is higher than Hong Kong's 6% vacancy and lower than Sri Lanka's Sia Box 56% vacancy. And this was according to ACC, result of the high attrition rate in 16.2% 2010 and 2014. Now, the situation improved in recent years. We look at 2016 to 2020, the number of vacancies has been reduced from 62 to 24, from 42% to 16%. But still, I still say that 16% vacancy is still quite high. And I think this problem has to be resolved. The CAC must try to, to resolve the problem of attracting and retaining personnel to reduce staff shortage. Now, the ACC annual report in 2014 gave five reasons why the ACC had a low recruitment by attrition. I think these reasons are still valid. I don't think they have changed. So I think things ACC must still try to find out to improve perhaps the working conditions in the ACC and try to I understand recently that threats were made against by those accused against the ACC and the family. So it's good to pro provide security for the ACC, but still the conditions in the ACC must be improved so it can be able to retain the staff. So the thing is that as a result of the staff shortage, the workload of the personnel has increased. That's why the way, especially the managers, can make it difficult to be effective in fighting corruption. The second problem was caused the backlog of corruption cases. Table H shows these are figures from the Bhutan ACC annual report 15. From 2006 to 15, the first 10 years, you can see that there was a huge backlog of 555 cases uh, from 2006 to 2015. Out of the 703 possible complaints, complaints qualified for investigation, only 148. One point we were signing the investigation. So this was a very big backlog. And the ACC resolved this problem by conducting two reviews in 2016. And these two reviews uh, resulted in the dropping of 390 complaints, presumably because of lack of evidence to pursue the vacancy further. And then in 2020, the number of backlog cases was further reduced to 96 in 2020. And this is the current. As far from the annual reports, the current backlog of uh, cases. So this staff shortage of ACC, of course, has entered its ability to resolve the backlog cases expeditiously. Now, let me now go on to two important causes of corruption. I don't have time to discuss other causes, but from my research, I think low salaries is an important cause of corruption. I quote here. My based on my work in Mongolia, when I was consultant for UNDP in Mongolia, and I did, I was struck by this thing I read from Mongolia that in the countryside, one in three judges 
is homeless. They don't have their own apartment. So as a result, they live in the office. And that's why it is the judges are very vulnerable to corruption. You can bribe them. In fact, when you want to win the case, you bribe the judges. The judge's salary at that time was only 50 US dollars a month. The present salary in Mongolia was 70 US dollars a month. My, my three star hotel room was 70 US dollars a month in Ulaanbaatar. So you can see how low the salaries were and why it encourages civil servants to be corrupt. So this is one example. And this is something my friend, Professor Nikos Passos, Professor of Political Science at the Northeastern UC in the USA, he made this very astute comment in his TEDx presentation in 2015. You cannot fight corruption on an empty stomach. You cannot fight corruption when salaries are below real living standards. So this is very important. How can you expect civil servants who are paid starvation wages, starvation wages for Philippines, for example. How do you expect them to be honest if they cannot feed their families? Another it's to comment by Samuel Lindner. She says, for civil servants with low salaries, corruption becomes a coping strategy to compensate for this is true all over the world, you know, including Singapore, Bhutan, all over. So, and the next example is case of India, and this the excellent book by Christensen, Ojoma, and Dylan, where in Chapman corruption, besides this example, the police officer in India earns twenty thousand rupees, about US two hundred ninety-five dollars a month, but he has a cost structure that means of US foreigner, but he needs 400 US dollars a month for his expenses. What does he do? He is going to be susceptible to corruption regardless of what the law laws to do. This is very realistic. I think it was bad or not. Now, in case of Bhutan, as far as I know, this is a revised series. The series were revised in 2019. This is a revised series scale of Bhutan to serve. And by but I would say, I think the salaries are quite low when you compare. I know the standard of living in Bhutan is much lower than Singapore, but salaries are huge, quite low. See, from the lowest from US, $120 a month to for cabinet level secretary, US, $1,125. Now, so this, the other cause of corruption is red tape. Red tape means all the procedures, all the national procedures. You make it difficult for businessmen to get permits, people get driving licenses, so people are prepared to pay bribes to expedite the process. So red tape increases operates corruption. So table 10 shows the ease of doing business rank Bhutan in Singapore. You can see overall ease of doing business. Singapore is second out, 190 economies, Bhutan is 81st. In terms of starting business rank, Bhutan is 91st, Singapore's third. In terms of procedures, eight procedures, Bhutan, 12 days for Bhutan. Singapore, two procedures, 1.5 days. Now, construction permits is more difficult. Bhutan ranks 88 out of 190. 21 procedures to get a construction permit. And 150 days, that's very long, a few days. Uh, oh, five months, yeah, to, to Kind of permit. Singapore, eight, right? 10 procedures, 41 days. Provisioning property rank, number of procedures in Bhutan, three, number of days, 77 days. Singapore, 21st rank, six procedures, 4.5 days. So obviously, from this table, rate becomes remains a problem in Bhutan because it takes 77 days to the property and 150 days to obtain the construction So if, if Bhutan citizens can improve streamline procedures, use e-governance perhaps, can perhaps reduce the amount of proceed, number of procedures 
nowadays to get the permits. Now, uh, the Royal Government of Britain must initiate reforms to rest these two causes of corruption, low wages, civil servants, and property. As I mentioned before, current money salary civil servants range from $128 for O4 level to US $1,125 for capacity. Impending reforms to improve low salaries of the civil service and the real rate of the civil service will help to reduce the extent of public sector corruption. A conclusion. I recently read this book by Bertram Spector, who is an anti-corruption consultant, and he, he said something very, very wise uh, in his book. Corruption is a hard nut, hard nut to crack. All of us who, who deal with fine corruption know this. Then the other quotation, which I thought is quite important too, is anti-corruption reform is a marathon, not a sprint. Marathon means it requires perseverance and sustained effort to fight corruption. And it is a continuous work in progress. You can never say you are, you are, you have, you have defeated corruption completely. Now, so table 11 shows the per capita expenditure and staff population ratios of four Asian anti corruption agencies in 2016. Hong Kong ICAC, Singapore CBIB, Bhutan ACC, Congress ACC. Now we can see here that the per capita expenditure of Hong Kong ICAC is very good. In fact, Hong Kong ICAC is a top in terms of per capita expenditure. US $17.77, sub population ratio 1 is to 5,366. CPIB is second, US. Uh, $4.89 as a capital expenditure and one to 26,700 staff population ratio. Bhutan here is that US $1.71 cents per capita and one is to 9,385 staff population. And Bangladesh, of course, is US 64 cents per capita expenditure. And one is to 169,741 sub population. Now, table 12 shows that the per capita expenditure for Tan ECC has improved compared to four years ago. So, 2020 is increased to $2.09 sub population ratio, has sort of improved to one is to 6,093. So, you can see here. That Bhutan's per capita expenditure and staff profit has increased, and staff profit ratio has also improved. These are all, all, all very good signs. So, in short, Bhutan has performed well in government corruption because the royal government has shown strong will in providing ACC with adequate resources. ACC is a type A ACA, an independent watchdog that enforces anti corruption laws impartially without political interference. The, a, the Royal government must avoid making a mistake, which many countries do, of using the ACC as an attack dog against its political power. So far, the ACC has been very good. It's, it is not an attack dog, and I hope this will remain so. Then also, to avoid becoming a paper tiger, the ACC must overcome the staff shortage by attracting and retaining personnel so that it can reduce this backlog of corruption case. The government was also make sure that it gives ACC enough resources to continue its anti-corruption work. Finally, the RG, Royal government has improved the salary of civil servants and reduce rate take civil servants. Let me now show you this last table of the three possible roles of anti-corruption agencies. The first is what I call the most desirable role, independent watchdog. So Singapore CPIB, Hong Kong CICC, Bhutan CCC, Indonesia KPK, Komisi Pandarayan Korosi, Anti-Corruption Commission. All these are very good. They are all independent watchdogs. Although recently, Indonesia 
KPK is being attacked by, by the politicians. The attack dog role, which should be avoided, which is highly undesirable, is very popular. And you can see Bangladesh ACC, Cambodia's ACU, China's CCDI, India's CBI, Myanmar's ACC, Pakistan's National Council Bureau, Vietnam's Government Inspector. All these are examples of the ACCs used by governments against political opponents. And thirdly, paper tiger. You have Afghanistan's High Office for Oversight and Anti-Corruption, India's CBI, Philippines' Office on Bush Pen, South Korea's Anti-Corruption Civil Rights Commission, and Taiwan's Agency Against Corruption. All these four, all these five are paper tiger. You know that India's ACBI is the only one that both attack talk and paper time. So my course, the advice here is that it's good that Bhutan is in Ben Bosho and the government and ECC must ensure it continues to be in Ben Bosho and not never, never become an attack dog or paper time. Let me give the last word to Prime Minister Lee Sian Lun of Singapore. In uh, during the 60th anniversary of CPIB, in his speech, he gave this uh, reminder. He said, we will never tolerate corruption and we will never accept any second. Anyone who breaks the rules will be caught and punished. No cover-ups, no matter how seen an officer or how embarrassing we be. It is far better to suffer an embarrassment and keep the system clean than to pretend that nothing and raw, and let the rot spread. And part of the solution has to be that if you do it, we will catch you and punish you. Thank you. Let me just uh, show you the so I wanted to show the, the last. Can't see. Okay, to so show the last slide. Okay, yeah, the suggest. I understand that the first two readings, uh, single effective anti corruption strategy, and bring cycle. These two, you have received the uh, copies, but the other two, the third one, combating Asian corruption, is a uh, my monograph. If you're interested, this. Monograph, 215, 17 monograph, compares anti corruption agency in six countries Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Philippines, China, and India. And there's like nine lessons for policymakers. The fourth article, Why Single Works, which the chairperson mentioned, uh, is a short article which shares with you five secrets of single success. So these are the uh, session for great. So let me thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much. It, uh, you, your presentation was very analytical and insightful, and uh, particularly the, the amount of effort that you took to uh, be very specific in drawing out the similarities and the uh, and the differences between uh, uh, Singapore and Bhutan, as well as other uh, uh, ACAs, the anti-corruption agencies, the performance, the indicators. Um, I think this was very, very useful and it uh, uh, begins the, the conversation of uh, the way forward in many sense. Uh, also for highlighting the causes and the pitfalls therein. And uh, the words of caution, the words of wisdom on the caution in terms of going forward. I also particularly um, enjoyed the data on uh, uh, how you've used uh, uh, the HR, uh, the, the attrition rate, and then the uh, vacancies, the um, uh, backlogs, and then also to uh, use the budgets to uh, 
contextualize it against the, the population. I think uh, these are again uh, different ways of looking at it uh, rather than just talking about HR problems and resource uh, constraints in a very generic uh, sense, but to actually put it down in statistics. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very insightful. And um, also the uh, differences between the roles of, uh, of an ACA uh, and corruption agency. Uh, particularly enjoyed that as well. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, also, the, very, uh, the um, words of your prime minister at the very end that you shared with us, uh, this really resonates with us uh, as well. And uh, uh, for the ACC, for the Anti-Corruption Commission, we, have, we also adopt what we call the high-risk, low-benefit slogan, which is basically making it, uh, as uh, you have quoted, uh, making sure that uh, there is no benefit in taking in in corrupt activities, that the risk of being caught is very high. And when you get caught, then the, uh, the cost is very high. So um, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, we, will, um, we will be taking questions, but uh, before I go to the questions on the floor, I do want to uh, just um, ask uh, to take on from your, uh, from your presentation. You talked at the very beginning about how uh, the zero tolerance to corruption was so important for uh, Singapore to succeed uh, as a nation um, and to get to where you are today. Um, in this sense, I um, would like to just recall that uh, while His Majesty the King has uh, been, uh, uh, has uh, highlighted integrity and fighting corruption for a very long time. The most recent was in the 114th National Day Address when uh, the call to integrity uh, as the very characteristic of the Bhutanese identity was uh, very profoundly and articulately uh, reminded to the nation. So uh, in this sense, I would like to ask a question uh, and in many ways, this is one of the, uh, um, one could say that a challenge that the ACC faces and uh, feels is one of the most uh, uh, a difficult one. As you say, it's a hard nut to crack. Um, how do you, um, well, how, what advice would you give in terms of, you know, the uh, ensuring that anti-corruption measures, the uptake of anti-corruption measures there is ownership in it by the citizens. Uh, we have the tendency that unless it affects you directly, a lot of people empathize with, um, uh, with actually those who, are, who get caught. Um, in a sense, the misplaced compassion. Uh, so there is this um, difficulty in, uh, in, uh, in the uptake of uh, anti anti-corruption measures and to own it and for, uh, for society to truly have a, a zero tolerance uh, policy. So um, how do we, I would like to ask a more, more uh, pointed question in terms of, could you share with us your insights on how zero tolerance to corruption be became both the cause as well as the consequence in Singapore as you um, highlighted in your speech. And, and how do you address that? Because we, right now- mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. It's a very, very serious issue. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can, okay. uh, Professor. Thank you. Uh, would, uh, uh, okay. sir, thank you. Uh, in Singapore's case, uh, I think very important reason why we've succeeded in fighting corruption is uh, the example shown by our late Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. When Lee Kuan Yew became Prime Minister in June 1959, at the age of 35, he received a lot of gifts. Everybody wanted to buy his favour, so he received lots of gifts. But he said, no, please don't give me any gifts. And also, he instructed the civil service 
to introduce legislations to prevent civil servants from serving you. So I think leadership by example, that's very important. Secondly, anyone, the, the rich and famous are not above the law. Anyone who is rich and famous, who is found guilty of corruption, must be punished. And the big fish, big fish must be punished and fried and publicized. From in Singapore, when a big shot is accused and of corruption, his photograph appears on front page of the Straits Times and all the newspapers. You cannot, Singapore is much smaller than Bhutan. Where can you hide your face? Even a forest people can find you. There's no, there's shame. It's a shame culture. We, so anyone who is found guilty of corruption has to be penalized. And as I said, South Korea, South Korea is too soft. They pardon people who are corrupt. So how do you expect South Korea to, to solve from corruption? That's why you don't understand. They pardon present legal, but present 55 percent of corruption to unpartied. It is encouraged to encourage, if you pardon people who are corrupt, you are encouraging corruption. So Singapore, no. If you are found guilty, found guilty, but by court, you are punished. That's it. No second chance, no discount. That's it. So, of course, it's also very important to highlight the negative consequences of corruption. If you take the example of South Korea, so many examples of China, so many examples of the consequence of corruption, the inspectors don't do their job. All sorts of calamities happen, people die, and yet there's still so much corruption. So you have to highlight whenever there's a corruption case. Our biggest case was, I think, a deputy CEO of the utilities board. He, he stole 14 million Singapore dollars. He was caught, he was jailed, and he had to pay back the fine. To pay, pay back the bribe. So this is the way to do it. You have to, in other words, the ACC, CPIB must be trusted by the people. People must say, oh, if I report this complaint to the ACC or CPIB, they will investigate the complaint carefully, fairly, fairly, fairly. And if there's enough evidence, they will punish those found guilty. So you must build trust. You, over the years in Hong Kong, Singapore, the number of anonymous complaints has dropped. The number of side complaints has gone. Then people trust the ICAC in Hong Kong. People trust the CPF in Singapore. And I, I also think that people in Bhutan trust the ACC. That's why you have many complaints. But you will never lose the trust in 2012, a very shocking thing happened in Singapore. A senior CPIB officer was caught embezzling 1.43 million US dollars on CPIB because it was a gambling addict. It was very shameful. It was, I was shocked myself. The whole country was shocked. As he was caught, he was punished, he was jailed for 10 years. So even CPIB officer, if found guilty, the full force of the law must be brought to bear and no exemption. In fact, in this case, the Commercial Affairs Department investigated the case to prevent conflict of interest. So in other words, in Singapore's case, anyone found guilty of corruption, no matter how senior, how junior you are, no matter political affiliation, if there's evidence against you, you are punished, you go to jail, and that's it. Many years ago, a professor in NUS, a professor of chemistry, was found guilty of corruption and he lost his job and he was jailed. So I think the point is that no matter who you are, you're found guilty, you're silly enough to be corrupt, you, you pay the price. And that's why we have to manage to keep corruption down. Because people know that you cannot escape, that it is, as Shepherds mentioned, it is a high risk no reward activity. If you commit corruption, the likelihood of being caught very high and the likelihood of being punished also very high. In China, 
China, a lot of talks you talk about Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. But actually, only 4.6% of those civil servants found guilty of corruption are penalized with a very soft approach. And a campaign in China, they use the campaign, the, the CCDI, as an attack dog. The CCDI is used by Xi Jinping against political opponents. That's why it's not successful. That's why corruption is still a problem in China and other countries. So I think to answer your question there is people must be seen to realize that corruption doesn't pay, that the country suffers. Now, Singapore has been able to succeed. Why? One major reason why, because we're not corrupt. In the 1990s, uh, Caltex was deciding where to put the refinery. Should they choose Thailand, Bangkok, or Singapore? In the end, they chose Singapore. Why? They chose Singapore because Singapore was seen to be clean, and we do not have to pay bribes to citizens to get the refinery set up. Thailand, you have to. So Caltex chose Singapore because of this clean government, no need to pay bribes. In fact, we have very good record on foreign investment because foreign investors like to invest in Singapore because there's zero budget for bribes. Zero. You don't need to put a, a sort of cater for bribes in your budget for investing in Singapore. Zero. No, no need. In fact, we welcome investment, but we don't welcome corrupt funds. So this is how and people have seen Singapore how we progress over the years from US GDP per capita of about 400 US dollars 1959 to over 72,000 US dollars today. Why? Because of zero tolerance to corruption. We don't need to be corrupt to do well in Singapore. You need to work hard, you need to have qualifications, you need to have the expertise, but you don't need to be corrupt. This was not the case in World War II. Japanese occupation, there was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of nepotism, a lot of bribery. People need to have connection. But that's of the press of past because we learned that corruption doesn't pay. Corruption doesn't pay because those who are corrupt must be punished, are punished for the misbehaving. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Professor. We have one from uh, from the slider. Um, retaining senior and experienced investigation officers is a pertinent challenge for ACC Bhutan. Right. How do we retain the best professionals in investigation? I think uh, you have to, I think as chairperson, you have to probably interview them because I don't know whether you do any exit interviews of those staff who left to find out why, why do they leave? Because people leave for different reasons, depending on their age, depending on the stages career. But the thing is that ACC, any, any, organ, any organization, not just ACC, people, people must be willing to stay on. It's not just, the money is part of it, but money, salary is a hygiene factor. There are other more important things. So you have to find out from your staff. And I think it might be good to have constant discussion with your staff to find out, uh, don't wait until problems arise. In the 1970s, 1970s, CPIB had a very serious problem of, of uh, presentation. 13 officers left for a period of years, or five years. This was very serious, but this was a uh, reflection of the problems facing the civil service as a whole, not just CPIB. Because at that time, single civil service had a lot of problems because salaries were low. Sales were very low because we were trying to improve our economy and the government couldn't, couldn't afford to raise salaries. But when they did a survey, they found that many people left services after five years for better prospects in the private sector or abroad. Private sector, private sector salaries were much higher than, than civil service salaries. So the government was forced from 1972 to raise salaries uh, incrementally over the years. Now, salaries and sales are very high, probably the highest in the world. And they're about two-thirds of those in 
private sector. Some cases, civil service are higher than private sector. So the thing now is salary is important, but salary is only one factor. You have to find out from these senior officers uh, what their problems are. What about options for training? Do they get proper training? Because now the criminals are very smart and with all the high, high tech, new techniques, you must send your officers for training to FBI or other, other relevant agencies for training. That's very important because you must help them do their job. Give them the skills, the skills, expertise to do the job. That's one thing. Giving them adequate salary, good working quality to maintain them there. But what is, what is important is how do you imbue with them the passion, the passion to stay on the job. That it is an honor to fight corruption as a Bhutanese citizen to join the to be part of ACC, ACC is very important to help fight corruption. So you have to not only give them the expertise, the adequate living con working conditions, and also give the environment of the ACC, but the one where it encourages them to want to, to do their best for the country. So I, I suggest there's no way out except to, to have dialogue, constant dialogue with your senior officers especially during your annual review, when you have annual review with them. You, this is where one-to-one -one you can be confidential, very, very frank, confidential. I said, what are the problems? What, what, what can be done? To, no, no organization is perfect, including CPIB. So what can be done to improve the situation in the ACC and the CPIB so that they can, the officers will want to stay? Or you can ask them, what is it that will make them leave the ACC? What is the things that will lead to ACC? Of course, there are other, other options elsewhere in Bhutan, also abroad. So you have to compete, not just ACC, all organizations in Bhutan. So you must compete with all these other, other attractive jobs. So the key is how do you... So in a way, when you recruit staff, this is very important. When you recruit staff, must try to recruit those people not just the qualifications, but they have to motivate, but it's very difficult to assess this. The motivation to, to work hard, to be an effective, efficient uh, ACC officer. So in other words, the training you give, the, the aptitude, the, the working as a team, teamwork in the organization must be, and also all those people who have done well must be rewarded, not just in terms of money, but in terms of, of uh, recognition, the best employer will best investigator, best investigator of the year. So that they, there are these extrinsic rewards, you know, the intrinsic reward, not just money, but also intrinsic rewards to to sort of in, improve their attachment to the organization. So in other words, there's no shortcut here. You have to find out from them. Actually, those who are going to leave or when he's in interview, and those who are still in the organization have, have constant dialogue with them to find out what's wrong, what can be done, what, what are the strengths of organization, what are the weaknesses. Strengths, of course, but weaknesses you must rectify because if you don't, then you will, you will, they will get worse. And I think as the ACC, you will know, you keep in touch with your... And also the thing is, it is very important to have staff who are not afraid to speak out. For example, if you are a good leader, good leader is one who, who likes the staff to be very frank in there, to tell what's wrong, not to be yes persons. Who thing is suffering now because there's so many yes persons wrong in. So I think you have to get people who are brave enough, who are concerned enough with the ACC to tell you the truth, tell the no matter how unpleasant it is, that's the only way. So that things can be done, things can be improved. So I don't know, this is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor. In fact, there were several questions related, but uh, I think you answered actually quite a few of these questions. So I will move on to another one. Um, again, from our online viewers, yeah. if, uh, if anybody on, uh, 
on the screen now here would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, uh, otherwise, I will go to the slide. There's another one. Um, what uh, more do you recommend for a nation like Bhutan with a small economy to be one of the most effective independent watchdogs in the region? I think the, the hallmarks of an independent watchdog is that you must never be used by the government for its own, for its, as an attack dog against its political opponents. This is the, the very important measure. So far, Bhutan has done well. Bhutan has not made a mistake. But this is a mistake which many governments, many governments do. Bangladesh, for example. Bangladesh, whoever is in government, whether the Bangladesh Nationalist Party or Wami League, they take turns. Which party comes to power, they use the, the ACC against the opposition. Then when they change government, the ACC is used again against the other party. So it is very sad, but unfortunately it's true. So how can Bangladesh, that's why I wrote an article recently about this, that it's difficult to fight crime, to minimize corruption in Bangladesh because of this. The standard procedure for ACC in Bangladesh is to attack the political opponents of the current regime in power. They take turns. They take turns. So Bhutan so far has done well. And I think they must, you must continue to be like that, to avoid this mistake, which many countries uh, use ACA as a tech dog. And that's why they, they cannot fight corruption effectively. The other, the other thing you must avoid is never become a paper tiger. And here I use South Korea. And South Korea, I don't know, South Korea is a very interesting case. But frankly speaking, a lot of nations are fooled by South Korea. South Korea's PR is very good. But South Korea, corruption is a very serious problem. South Korea, KICAC, Korea Independent Community Corruption, was set up to sign two. Actually, the plan was to set KICAC as a replica of the Hong Kong ICAC. But the police objected, the prosecution department objected. Many people objected because they didn't want a strong KICAC. So KICAC was set up as a toothless ACA without the ability to investigate corruption cases. This is the only, country, only ACA, in, ACA in the world which cannot investigate corruption cases. How ridiculous, right? Your ACA, you cannot investigate corruption cases. You outsource the function of investigate corruption to other agencies. How ridiculous. Then, to make matters worse, in 2008, President Lee Yung Bak wanted, he said, to improve KICAC. Actually, that's not true. He wanted to dilute KICAC's anti corruption He merged KICAC with Ombudsman and Ministry of Tribunal to form the Anti-Corruption and Civil Rights Commission in 2008. This is actually a laughing stock. The ACRC is a paper tiger that cannot investigate corruption cases. That's why they set up another, another uh, ACA risk last year, Criminal Investigation Office to investigate uh, corruption. So I don't understand why so many countries in the UN honor South Korea for fighting corruption when they are doing a very bad job because they ACRC paper. So my advice is AACC must never be a paper tiger or a tech law. As long as you do that, and the government must continue to give ACC enough resources so that it doesn't have to cut stuff very again to improve its, its uh, staff shortage so that it can remain independent of stock. I will answer a question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That, right. was, uh, that was a very powerful response. Um, I would like to ask, uh, oh, okay, we have two hands. Uh, sure. yeah. Shall we have uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Renchen Kunsel, and then Mr. Uh, Hong?
Ambassador, you have to unmute. Sorry, in my excitement to ask the question, okay. I forgot my microphone was uh, muted. No problem. Thank you, Chairperson, for the opportunity, and also thank uh, thank you, Professor John Kaur, for the presentation. I have uh, two questions, uh, slightly related. Yeah. Uh, in one of your slides, you said that you you quoted someone saying that you cannot fight uh, corruption on empty oh. stomach which I understood to mean that uh, corruption is uh, uh, more susceptible among, uh, you know, uh, uh, people uh, or persons, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, lower income group, let's put it like that. But we also have had uh, corruption cases in uh, people whose stomachs are not empty who are well off and who didn't have that money so sure. i would like to hear your sure. comments on that sure. that's number one and then the second related question is you mentioned uh, about the salary of civil servants and how the low salary uh, makes civil servants vulnerable to corrupt practices uh, for for a country or a government to raise the civil servants' uh, salary to uh, dissuade them from corrupt practices would depend on the uh, economic situation of the country. If the country doesn't have the economic means to pay the civil servants enough to dissuade them from involving in corrupt practices, uh, how can we, in the meantime, uh, what can we do to you know, uh, prevent corruption or uh, nah, ensure that public services servants do not engage in corruption uh, uh, because of the you know the difference they have to meet between the salary and the management they have to uh, bear uh, to sustain the livelihood. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Excellent question. Uh, let me answer the two questions. First, yes, the quotation by Professor. Because pastors focuses more on petty corruption. It means corruption at a low level. But uh, doesn't mean, see, the UN once said that petty corruption is not really petty because you add up all the amounts from petty corruption, it's still quite a big amount. But also, you're right. Apart from petty corruption, there's also grand corruption, which is what you were referring to. Corruption by senior people who own much higher salaries and are not hungry. But but the corruption is is caused by greed, by greed. For these people, no matter how much you pay them, it's never enough. It is greed. So in other words, when you want to fight corruption, you focus more both on petty and grand corruption. It's easy to fight petty corruption because they are very junior people or power. But it is very important to fight grand corruption too. In fact, in the Philippines, the office of ombudsman some time ago, under a particular regime, was viewed as the street ombudsman because they only went after the petty still petty corruption offences and ignored the grand corruption offence. So my view is that both petty and grand corruption are uh, offences and must be investigated and punished if they are found guilty. Your other question. Is very important. To pay salaries, high salaries, is very expensive. That's that's true. That's true. And that's why in Singapore's case, from 19, when the People's Social Party came to power, 59, they had a huge budget deficit caused by the previous government. So they had to cut salaries. They had to cut the cost of living allowances of senior civil servants to, to save $10 million. And so they couldn't raise service. So from 1959 to 1971, service were not increased at all. Singapore. Even though, even though salary commission of 1968 recommended salary increases, but the government says, sorry, we can't afford it. But after 1971, the government saw that Many civil servants were leaving the civil service after five years of service. Why? Because the private sector was paying high salaries 
than the civil service. So fortunately, by 71, 72, the economy has improved. And so the government was forced to increase the salaries of civil servants in Singapore. And finally, came increasing. Until 1995, the government uh, packed the salaries of civil service to five uh, sectors in the private sector because the private sector was paying very well. For example, uh, during the good years, a person would get six months bonus in private sector. Civil service after 1972, only one month bonus. So the huge gap was the main reason why people didn't stay civil service. So the government realized that they had to raise them. But the other point is I understand Bhutan is trying to improve his economy. And unless you improve the economy, you can't raise salaries. That, that, is, that is understandable. And I think so far, the cost of living in Bhutan is much lower than in Singapore. But the point is that when it comes to time where the gap is very high, I don't know what the gap is now between public and private sector salaries in Bhutan. But once the gap becomes very high, you find that you will lead to a big outflow of people into private sector. Now, let me just say that during the years when salaries were not increased in Singapore, it is very important that the anti-corruption laws are enforced, sadly. So from 1959 to 71, when salaries were not improved, the CPIB enforced the laws impartially. Anybody found guilty of corruption was punished, regardless of status position. So this is the thing, you know, right now, ACC is doing a good job is enforcing the law. But I, my suggestion is that as Bhutan economy improves, I think the ACC, the government has improved the service, civil service, including the ACC also. Otherwise, you find that it will exacerbate the problem of retaining personnel and also for other people, civil servants, trying to make it difficult for them to, to refuse bribes. I will answer the question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ambassador. Joshua, just come on. Do you want to go? Thank you, La. In fact, my question, Professor, is uh, in a way slightly related to question number two raised by Ambassador Chen. Sure. Uh, nonetheless, I will, I will maybe elaborate a little further in terms of what uh, I am thinking. Thank so you. earlier you, you highlighted uh, two issues we need to address uh, to combat corruption. Uh, one is the low wages, civil servants, uh, salaries. And the other one is that of red tape, yeah. uh, particularly on you know low salaries for civil servants. Uh, as as Ambassador Inchen mentioned, uh, you know for a country like Bhutan, resource constrained uh, country like Bhutan, it's always a challenge. As much as you would like to pay your civil servants, the government also has very limited funds in its exchequer and. Uh, even as we speak, uh, we as a country depend a lot on donor funds for most of yeah. our capital uh, projects and other developmental works. And uh, the other issue is, you know, when salaries increase, it is in a way incremental, 20%, 25%. And then inflation, whether it's real or artificial, catches up. So your house rent goes up, your rice price goes up, your cooking oil price goes up, everything goes up. And... Uh, at the end, then you might find yourself uh, sometimes worse off, you know, after a, a nominal increment in your salary because of the inflation. And then, uh, uh, you know, as you said, civil servants need to be paid well so that they are less corrupt or less prone to corruption. But then uh, it is also civil servants, particularly the bureaucratic machinery, you know, as, as the engine of the government in a way, uh, it is, us who need to really uh, work hard and catch up so that the country makes more money, the government's able to uh, fulfill its uh, pledges for economic development or for uh, any other development. So, and then we have issues of attrition, whether it's uh, uh, good civil servants leaving for the private sector or uh, in our case today, leaving abroad for greener pastures. 
So to me, like this, this is like a catch-22 situation. You know, we want to do well as a country. Uh, we want to pay our civil servants well. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also realize that the government has, you know, uh, serious challenges in terms of funds, and the civil servants need to work hard uh, for us to, you know, be really paid well. Uh, I think in a way we are as civil servants responsible for our own higher salaries. So I'm just wondering how if Singapore, you know, uh, had gone through something like this when it was a developing country like Bhutan, and how what were some of the you know, key measures uh, that, that the Singapore government took to, to address such very, very complex issues. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your questions. Yes, as I mentioned before, when Singapore, when Lee Kuan Yew became Prime Minister in June 1959, there was a salary cut uh, because the previous government had overspent the budget. And so what the government did was to cut what they call the cost of living allowance, COLA, of senior civil servants. And this, this created a lot of problems also. But they cut it, cut it uh, so that to reduce the budget deficit. But then the CPIB enforced the anti-corruption laws impartially. This is very important. The so ACA anti-corruption agency must enforce the law, especially when salaries are low. Very often you find this is not the case. When salaries are low, you find there's a lot of corruption. The ACA doesn't do its job. So I think it's very important that that the government, uh, I understand that it is very expensive to raise salaries, but the point is that if whenever it's possible, whenever the, the economy improves in Bhutan, this improvement must be reflected in some improvement in the salaries and working conditions in the system. For example, in Singapore, the police were very corrupt. The police, in fact, were the most corrupt agency in Singapore during the colonial period. Because the salaries were very low, especially the local police officers compared to expatriate. And then they had to have second jobs to, to, to make living. So, but over the years, we have improved the salaries of the police, strengthened it as over now. That's why now the police in Singapore is very clean now, no longer corrupt. But it took a long time, some time. So I think the point is that, uh, yes, when you want to improve salaries, you have to, uh, it's very expensive and you have to improve there must be economic growth. So that's why Singapore's case, the government realized this. Salaries will only improve when the economy improved. We couldn't do so, but we're still trying to improve the economy. After improving the economy, then the government was forced to raise salaries, not just to fight corruption, that's part of it, but very important to keep and attract the best and brightest. This is one of the secrets I mentioned in my 2018 article. Attracting the best and brightest to the civil service by focusing on education, giving out scholarships, and by paying them competitive salaries compared to the prime sector. Because if you don't do that, not just fighting corruption, if the salaries in civil service continue or do not improve uh, over time, you are going to have a significant brain drain to other private sector jobs in Bhutan, or as mentioned, as you mentioned, to abroad, other appearance abroad now. Now it's so easy to travel, you can work abroad. So I think this is the challenge. How, how do you, in Singapore's case, for example, we were able to fight corruption too because the, we were also able to encourage foreign investment. I don't know the situation in, in Bhutan, how much foreign investment you have. Because the only way to, to improve the economy is to encourage foreign investment into the country. Of course, you can have a lot of safeguards. But in Singapore's case, we were able to improve because Singapore market is very small. We only 5.6 million people. Whatever we produce is not enough for the country. Therefore, we have to produce for the whole world. But we need foreign investment first for the skills that skills that uh, 
I will part to local from the locals, the multinationals, and then also with the investment, we have enough resources to uh, to improve the economy and bring more jobs to the population. So I, in Bhutan's case, probably you might need to have some sort of, you might have already had this task force to see how to improve the economy, how to improve opportunities for foreign investment as a way to improve the, the economy. Because at the end of the day, if you don't make any changes, if your service remains static or increase incrementally, you're going to lose people. People, the world is very open now. You can travel anywhere, you can go anywhere on the internet. So if you're not happy with the working conditions, you can go elsewhere to other countries. Where all countries are competing, Singapore, Thailand, all that, doing Japan now, competing for talented people from other countries to come to, to Singapore, Tha Thailand, or Japan. Now. So I think this is the challenge that we face. How Bhutan's case, I don't know what is the situation regarding foreign investment. Does your government welcome foreign investment? I know you rely a lot on foreign donors, but that relying foreign donors is uncertain. You know? Anytime they can withdraw, the Swiss Development Agency will do the funding for ECC some years ago. So it is good to have foreign, foreign donors, but it is not it is, uh, risky. It's a risky strategy. It's better to try to find other ways of improve, improving economy. And I don't know, I'm not an economist, so I don't know how, whether you have thought of improving options for foreign investment in your country. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Professor, um, we have um, many more questions from uh, our online participants. Um, I don't see I don't see any raised hands here, so I'll go to the um, online questions. Um, Many corruption cases are not investigated for lack of formal reports. Is taking up the case without receiving a complaint being an attack dog? How should we deal? Uh, before I hand over to you, Professor, I just want to elaborate a bit on this. Uh, uh, perhaps this comes from uh, the fact that uh, uh, in the past, the ACC had the uh, investigations of ACC has uh, relied on complaints being filed. Uh, there have been proactive uh, uh, investigations as well, but it is uh, less than 10% of the in total investigations which come from proactive uh, sources. But now, um, as a part of our own reform process as well, uh, in fact, we are trying to break this plateau, the stagnation at 68. We've stayed at TICPI 68 for the last four years. So we also see that uh, proactive investigation is perhaps uh, mm, uh, something we have to strengthen intel-based investigations. But I would also be particularly interested to hear your views on that, on proactive investigations. Yes, I think this is always a difficult part when you rely on complaints. First, the complaints, whether it is anonymous or whether it is signed. Of course, sign complaints are better because you are able to interview the complainant to get more details. In fact, CPIB prefers also uh, a possible sign complaint, but of course, they still entertain anonymous complaints also. But in order for complaints to be rescued, there must be, there must be sufficient facts, as you know, sufficient uh, details about the person's offense and so on. So sometimes it's very very difficult to proceed. And also in Singapore's case, that uh, to prevent malicious complaints, if it was found that the complaint is malicious, the person will, can be punished you know, accordingly. So we assume that those who make complaints are sincere and have a complaint. But proactive, the thing is, the proactive uh, complaints, it depends on how you need to have some some sort of uh, before you begin to investigate corruption, 
there might be some sort of clue, some sort of evidence, that some sort of hint that there's, there's some corruption. So when you talk about complaints, complaints are for the right. If I complain, then you investigate whether it's valid or not. But when it's proactive complaints, unless you rely on informers, no? Informers. Uh, uh, in fact, South Korea tried this and has the work. Whistleblowing, whistleblowing. And they reward people a lot of money for whistleblowing South Korea, but I don't think it's very successful. Because of, so the point is that uh, you have to, if, if there are whistleblowers, I think whistleblowers must be protected and must be treated fairly. Because the record of whistleblowing, whistleblowers is not, not very good. In fact, it is very dangerous to be a whistleblower all over the world, the US particularly. Serpico, for example, was received a contract for exposing his colleagues in the New York Police Department. So the thing is proactive. Uh, thing is, it is good if you think that they accept some good leads. But in the end, in other words, we are talking about intelligence, I think, right? Intelligence. What sort of intelligence networks that you have in your country? Who are the people you can contact? Who's going to contact to, to, uh, for information or for clues to proceed investigations? I think Singapore's case, I think CPIP is well trusted. That's why people know that if, there's, if they see something wrong, they report to CPIB and CPIB will take action and to see that something is done. If there is valid, if there is valid grounds for the complaint, action will be taken and people will be in. The newspapers always announce so and so is arrested for investigation by CPIB. So people will know that review if they've some, done something wrong, there's a lot of publicity and so on. Also, although fortunately we have very few cases so far, about four cases from what I know of CPIB officers found guilty of corruption. Whenever CPIB officer is found guilty of corruption, there's no cover. There's a lot of publicity report in the newspaper, the trial reported, the punishment report. So that people know that even your CPIB officer, you're not exempt from from prosecution and you're punished according to the law. So I, I don't know, uh, proactive, maybe you can elaborate in case of Bhutan, what do you mean by proactive without sharing any confidential secrets? Thank you, Professor. As uh, you were saying, um, you the way I understand this question is that uh, ACC, most of ACC investigation has depended on uh, complaints. Oh. And often complaints are um, uh, you know, do not have much information. Uh, and also because it is uh, anonymous, then there is no uh, way to follow up also. So that is, uh, that is how I understood it. And uh, actually just for information this year, for the very first time in ACC's history, we have uh, more uh, known complaints than anonymous complaints. We have a total of 435 complaints for this financial year, out of which 419 are uh, known complaints and 416 are um, anonymous complaints. So that is a, a trend. But in terms of uh, intel-based investigation, what we are thinking of uh, in ACC and where we are trying to build uh, our competence is actually to be able to do strategic studies. Uh, also, uh, as you also point out, uh, certain uh, database integration, certain um, networking, certain, there will be those kind of things, but also to do strategic, to be able to do strategic studies. In fact, I'm reminded of uh, yesterday's uh, session with uh, Professor Jeff, uh, when he said, uh, uh, when he recalled the words of uh, the former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, that uh, it's important to not only stay relevant, but keep three steps ahead. So in that sense, uh, even for um, uh, fighting corruption, it is important that we try to stay ahead. So in that sense, proactive, intel-based uh, work would be um, very relevant. And uh, we also see it as a way of uh, breaking out from that 68, stagnation at 68 in the TICPI um, score. Um, 
Okay. Uh, if I may, um, there, there there is another question, but I I would like to uh, ask a question just to um, kind of uh, shift the thought process uh, a bit. Uh, uh, Professor, given your very wide experience and the research that you've done over such a long period of time and focusing on anti-corruption, do you uh, personally see uh, a time in Singapore when a CPIB would not be necessary, when your systems would be so inbuilt, when your society would be so inbuilt, when your education system would be so, uh, um, uh, you know, would reach that level, when you know, integrity would be a norm and, uh, you know, a CPIB would not even be necessary to uh, to uh, to enforce? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> I don't think so. I think as long as uh, human beings, there are some of them who will be there who want to test the system. So my answer is no. We have to continue. CPIB, ACC, Bhutan, have to continue the work. You can we cannot rest on laurels because there's no such thing as the end is here. People, corrupt individuals evolve, they become smarter. They now now with blockchain, all the new technologies, they try all sorts of ways to beat the system because they want to benefit personally from all the corruption. So unfortunately, I wish that were the case, but I don't think so. If we still need CPIB, we still need ACSD. And people still need to be very careful. Now we in Singapore, we have a lot of scams. A lot of scams. I don't know about Bhutan, but there's so many scams every day. You report it, people are scammed. Uh, and I don't know why people are still so silly to give their personal details to not to these are not uh correct uh SMS, it's all fake. As yet people will willingly give their personal information, then they get robbed of thousands or millions of dollars. It's going on every day in Singapore. Even though we're educated, our National Crime Foreign Council doing a good job, telling people to avoid all this scam, but still people fall victim. And I, unfortunately, we still get reports in straight time about people being arrested for corruption. Not many, not many, yeah? But still, we still have people who want to test the system, who don't believe CPIB is effective, they want to test. I'm sure Busan, same thing. They want to test the system. So unfortunately, no. I think as long as we have the humans, that's why I say in one of my writings that fighting corruption is a continuous work in progress. We, you, we can never say we are victorious. We have to improve all the time. Improve, as, as you mentioned, be a few steps ahead because the corrupt individuals are very smart people. And we need all the help we can get to fight them, to, to defeat them. And the other thing I might forgot to mention just now, talking about proactive, I think the trend all over the world now is that the increasing threat is private sector corruption. I think Bhutan, Singapore, public service sector corruption, not that serious, is declining. The number of cases is declining. You see Singapore, Hong Kong. Bhutan's case, I don't know, but probably you can see the trend to number of private sector craft cases increasing over the years. And this is where you might have to concentrate your energy to see in private sector cases, whether there are private sector cases and what are the, the causes of corruption in these cases so that action can be taken by ACC or recommendation committee. So this is a trend now of private sector corruption is becoming much more important then in those countries where they have been able to, to minimize public sector corruption, Singapore, Hong Kong, for example. Thank you, uh, Professor. Um, there's, uh, there's another question from our online uh, participants. The question is, um, what would you recommend to improve the rate of service delivery uh, to curb corruption? Service delivery as a um, uh, way to curb corruption. Yes, I, I don't know the situation, Bhutan, whether, because the question assumes that 
when we talk about red tape, huh? red tape. Uh, very often, red, red tape refers to a lot of unnecessary procedures. Procedures, in the ways the, the government makes it difficult for you to get a driving license, for example, to, to get all sorts of permits. In South Korea, for example, many years ago, it's, it's improved a lot now. Many years ago, it, it requires 44 permits, 44, to get a building license for a factory. And it takes years. So if you don't have to wait that long, you pay. You, you, you bribe the corresponding person, inspector, to get the permit. So the, the permits red tape is the obstacle that prevents businessmen and citizens to get the permits. So how do you solve the problem? You solve the problem by paying bribes. And in other words, as I said, one of my writings that, that uh, red tape, uh, bureaucrats, corrupt bureaucrats love red tape. Because red tape gives them the excuse to accept bribes to, to, to cut the red tape. So South Korea has improved now. South Korea has, uh, using online uh, e-governance now, you, can, you have to, to apply online. So there's no corruption now. The, very transparent, everything is counted. So Philippines, Indonesia, it takes a long time to get a driver's, driver's license. It takes you months to get a driver's license. So what do they do? In the Department of Motor Vehicles, you have what we call fixers, fixers. So these are corrupt individuals who loiter around the department asking the those queuing up. You queue up, you can queue up for hours. To, so if you would want to queue up, don't want to queue up, pay me a fee. And this fixer will arrange with the official to give your driving license almost straight away for a fee. So these fixers are there, Philippines, Indonesia. There are fixers all over civil service for waiting for you to bribe them or you for them to fix to, to, to cut the process short. So definitely, by right, in India, in this case too, there's so many complaints to get driving license, birth certificate, death certificate, you have to pay a bribe. One person said from, from birth to death, you have to pay bribes. So if you improve the delivery of services, especially if you, you online, then you cut down. You cut down the reasons for bureaucrats to, to give them an excuse to bribe you. You do direct a computer or do direct with the individual so that there is no, no need to pay bribes. But unfortunately, in many countries, people realize that they don't pay bribes, they have to wait a long time. And very often, they don't want to wait or they cannot afford to wait. So definitely, improving the service is very important. If services are by right, public services should be free and should be delivered as quickly as possible. But where this is not possible, this is where civil servants come in, corrupt civil servants come in and exploit the system, exploit the businesses and demand bribes from, from individuals. So definitely I agree that public service, I notice in Bhutan, the corruption in the local government is much higher, much higher, right? From the annual reports you see, much higher than, than in the central government. So perhaps you should have to look at why, why is this the case? What are the reasons why corruption is higher in the local government? What can be done to reduce the instance of corruption at the local, local government levels? Hope I answered the question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is uh, another question also from our online uh, participants. Um, since uh, in Bhutan, power corruption is most prevalent, how can we deal with power corruption? Yeah, yeah I would just like to add that indeed, uh, I think uh, what is being referred to is abuse of function abuse of force in positions of authority, abuse of function. So uh, it is indeed uh, the national uh, 
integrity assessment also finds that abuse of function is the highest uh, category of uh, uh, corrupt offenses. Even uh, the complaints that we receive, the highest number of uh, complaints is pertaining to uh, abuse of function. Here, the, it's referred as power corruption, but I would think it is about abuse of function. And uh, I would also uh, really look forward to hearing your response to it, uh, uh, Professor. I, I don't know what you mean by abuse of function because the, uh, these complaints made by the civil servants or by citizens? This, uh, this came from our online participants. It's on the Slido. Yeah. Uh, so uh, power corruption, I would think that it is about uh, misuse of authority and about uh, misusing positions of power. Well, assuming that the complaints are valid, the complaints are valid, then I guess you have to try and figure out whether what is the cause of this abuse of power. Is it because that means does it mean that these are the senior officials, senior officials who are involved and who do not? I guess the only way to tackle this is for the people involved to to complain and to provide details so that so that these individuals if they have actually abused power, must be made accountable. The question is that it is difficult to, to do that because you, you said, as I mentioned, to be whistleblower, it must require a lot of courage to be whistleblower. And so very often, people are afraid of don't report the abuse of power. And so this thing continues. So the, the point about abuse of power, it is very difficult to fight unless do you have sufficient information that you know who is the person involved? What did he or she do that is abusive so that the, the misconduct can be avoided? So I, unless, I don't know what, what Kira Bhutan because I have seen the charge showing abuse of function is the highest, but there are not enough details in the annual report about this abuse of function. So maybe you might want to, in the terms of research, analyze all these cases that are reported to see whether there are any common common uh, features or not. Does it, is it, which which department? Because I noticed you also do by agency department. So where does the abuse of function, uh, where is the most percent percentage? Where can you find the most number of abuse of functions in the which department, which agency. I suspect from, I don't know about Bhutan, but my research time elsewhere, police department is one of those. See, those departments where, see, Indonesia, Indonesia, there are two types of departments they categorize people. One is called the wet agencies, wet agencies or dry agencies. Wet meaning is like paddy field, wet. Wet agencies means that you have opportunities for corruption, police, immigration, customs, right? These are police, immigration, customs. Very wet agencies, a lot of opportunities for corruption, right? Or dry, dry with university, research, research found, etc. So, for I suspect that abuse of power function would probably be prevalent in wet agencies. I draw about Bhutan. Maybe you have to analyze very carefully the abuse of functions where, in terms of distribution, which department, which ministry, which department. But my suspect that we might have be common in maybe police, I don't know, Bhutan police or immigration customs to see whether, where, where people have to go to get permits, where people have to ask for something, application to get things done, and yet, the opportunities for the officials not to be going to the book for whatever reason. I think you have to analyze very carefully the, the, the distribution of the functions of the abuse of functions to get an, some idea of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It is indeed a very... Uh...
wide subject. We do what we call the uh, integrity assessment every th three years, and we try to break it down into, as you say, by agency that we do. Uh, uh, also, we have the organizational integrity plans and the mandatory indicators. But in the integrity assessment, we try to look at uh, the, uh, the leadership culture, the ethic, ethics, the work culture. So uh, there is quite a bit of uh, uh, analysis uh, being attempted to break this down a bit more. As you say, it, it needs uh, to be broken down uh, to, to be addressed. Uh, there is another question, uh, Professor, and I think uh, maybe that will be the second last, uh, uh, a very quick one. How important is decentralization of power and governance important for combating corruption? I think decentralization is important for large countries. Singapore's case is a very small island, so the question of decentralization doesn't really, does not really important. Bhutan, of course, is much larger, larger than than uh, Singapore, and I think Bhutan also. I don't know whether your ACC do you have got branches in other parts of Bhutan or? In this last one year, three. I do you have three. Bhutan? That's the ACC have branch offices in our parts or you do? Yes, this year we opened three districts. Okay. I think it is important because of your terrain too, that if you just have one in, in Timbu, people won't make complaints will not be so easy. You know, you can use the, understand that they use online complaints are the most common in Bhutan. But still, it's good to have branch offices. Even Hong Kong ICAC, because Hong Kong is quite small, has got branch offices also. Uh, but for larger countries, decentralization is important to reach out to people in the outlying areas, Indonesia, for example. But at the same time, when you have decentralization, the central uh, ACC in the central government must be able to make sure that the same standards apply, same standards apply to the branch officers in terms of investigation, in terms of uh, uh, all the procedures so make sure that they are same standard not different standards so that there will be a same there will be no deterrent standards in fighting corruption around the country so decentralization depends on the, the country size of the country i think Bhutan's case you need to have but you must make sure that uh, the standards are, are, are maintained in fighting corruption thank you so we are coming to uh, 4 30 now but i would like to ask one last question and a very quick question um, given the resource crunch um, what would you um, advise while uh, like in cpiv as well as in many other successful uh, anti-corruption agencies there is that three-pronged approach to fighting corruption prevention education and investigation but if uh, due to resource crunches of a developing country you had to uh, prioritize what would you go for prevention education or investigation actually all three are important all three are important but in cpb's case initially if you look at the slide function. Initially, the CPRB focused on investigation, investigation, and uh, and uh, prevention, because it didn't have much time for education. Later on, education became, became much more important. But still, my criticism of CPRB is that they don't have, in, even though they have more stuff than ACC, I still feel that CPRB as well as staff, they must increase their staff and they must have a foreign Hong Kong, a community relations department. I think Bhutan has got all three, right? Bhutan, you have both investigation, prevention, education. This is very important because you have to have this three, three strong strategy to fight corruption. Perhaps the difference emphasis, emphasis here. Right now, I think in your case, focus is on investigation, right? Investigation and less so on prevention and education. Over time, as your staffing improves, you can then 
give equal emphasis. Singapore's case now, I've told the director of CPIB, they should increase the emphasis on prevent on education and create a competitive relationship department because they don't, compared to Hong Kong ICAC, CPIP is very small. It's about one six or one seven size of ICAC. So CPIP server can increase further, but as like Bhutan's case, they have to increase the personnel channel of getting good personnel to join CPIP. So I think the, there is no substitute for the emphasis on the three. You have to continue because you cannot just investigate and prevent and not educate. But at the end of the day, public, the citizens at large, are your clientele. The citizens must realize that corruption is bad news for the country, right? And they must help, they must collaborate with the ACC, CPIB to help fight corruption. Because if corrupt individuals win, you can see many countries, then we all suffer, we all suffer. So the, the fight is endless, it's continuous, and ACC is doing a good job. I think the government must continue to support, the royal government must continue to support ACC, and hopefully ACC can get more staff and retain the staff so they can do an even better job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I will. Uh, I think we've come to uh, the end of our session. Unfortunately, uh, thank you so much for being so open and uh, for sharing so generously with us today. Um, uh, also, thank you to all the participants uh, here on uh, uh, on screen. We have. Uh, uh, I think uh, some 22 and also online and also those who are uh, attending as a group. Thank you so much. I also want to thank uh, two RICS officials who are here with me and who've uh, actually uh, synthesized all the questions. I think there were a number of questions and which they actually put together very quickly and uh, helped me uh, uh, put this up to uh, the forum here. So thank you, Sonam and Nishil. Uh, thank you, Riggs, again. Thank you, uh, all the participants here. And above all, thank you so much, Professor, for uh, being with us and for sharing so generously and uh, giving us so much food for thought. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, session. Uh, can I say that uh, if you are interested in more questions or one my response, please send me an email. My email address is transfer site. Send me an email and I will try to answer your questions. If there are other questions about my other publication, please free, feel free to write to me and I'll reply. Thanks very much for your kind attention and for giving a chance for me to share my, my research on corruption in Asian countries. Thank you very much. Professor, thank you. And uh, last but not the least, we have uh, RICS Research Officer, Ms. Lily Yangchen to say a few words to thank uh, you and everyone else. Lily? And thank you, Am Chair. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Your Excellencies, Dr. Shows, Professor John Kuo, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for yet another invigorating talk this week. On behalf of the director and staff at RICS, I'm honored to have this opportunity to thank our speaker for engaging us in this enriching discussion today. It was our privilege to have Professor Kuo with us, sharing your experiences and expertise on curbing corruption in such detail and with convincing facts and figures. With continued emphasis on accountability and strong leadership by His Majesty the King in various royal addresses, the topic of today's lecture seems pertinent and timely for us towards realizing our country's small, uh, our small nation's profound development goals. Learning from Singapore's success in combating corruption, we must understand corruption as, quote, both a cause and consequence of poor governance in a country. <laughs> As 
Professor aptly underscored the importance of having an effective civil service and sound public administration and corruption. This highlights the intricate relationship between governance, public service, and anti-corruption effort under the overarching ideas of good leadership and strong political will. So thank you, Professor, for prompting us to recognize these connections more meticulously and relate them to the larger context of nation building, especially at this juncture of the major reforms taking place in our bureaucracy. Bhutan is faring fairly well with its corruption perception index in the South Asian region. And as noted in the talk, the ACC has successfully maintained its status as an independent watchdog in the country. Still, we have much more to learn and far more potential to realize in the national and international arena in, con in continuing to uphold the high risk, low reward principle. Taking inspiration from Singaporean values of impartiality and consistency and its strategic empowerment of the, its Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau, coupled with the recommendations explored today, we hope that our leaders and lawmakers have acquired a renewed sense of optimism to address this corruption that is impeding our country's growth in both visible and invisible forms. On this front, we are equally fortunate to have the chairperson of ACC moderate the session today. Thank you, Chair, for guiding the discussion toward this effort in bringing our leaders together to reflect on and carry forward the conversation we have initiated. Likewise, thank you to our audience members for your active participation and for asking relevant questions. We are indebted to you for your continued support and encouragement. I would also like to give a special shout out to all the participants, including our distinguished guests who have joined us for all three of our lectures this week. We hope to see you all again on our Friday Forum lecture with eminent speaker, Ambassador Tommy Ko, day after tomorrow on the 14th, who will further encapsulate the lessons from Singapore's success story in effective nation building. Thank you all so much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Chair. Thank you, all our distinguished guests and participants. Hope to see you all on Friday. Thank Professor, you. we will be in touch. Thank you Thank so much. You. Okay.